Nvidia finds itself in an uncomfortable position. The demand for chips from crypto industry has died down. All the big tech companies are in the process of making their own chips. And the pandemic fuel demand for a chip has also fizzled out. But it is not the first time where the company has been in a bit of a pickle. Rather, Nvidia is a company which is shaped by crisis, where it accepts crisis with both hands. Nvidia, as of this moment, is the 13th largest company in the world, worth more than $400 billion. Whereas most hardware manufacturers fight for razor thin margins, Nvidia sits comfortably at more than 60% gross margin. In this video, we are going to look back at how a small startup in less than three decades and countless near death experiences came out of be the giant it is today. The story of Nvidia is not about perfecting market time, but of constant reinvention. It is not about small optimization, but of disrupting its own industry time and time again. Learning about Nvidia's history will help us understand the constant cycle of disruption and Nvidia thrives in it. I want to show you this by focusing on two key time frames of rapid change during Nvidia's history and how its current bets point towards the beginning of its third phase of reinvention. But before all of this, let me give you a very quick intro of what Nvidia is and what does it do. Nvidia was founded in 1993 by Jensen Huang, Curtis and Chris. Their main focus was creating graphic cards, primarily used in video games. It was a very competitive market with more than 30 players because of which the margins were razor thin. Before we dive deep, let's understand what exactly GPU mean and how is it related to a CPU. CPUs, as we all know, is a central processing unit. Think of them like a Swiss Army knife, like a jack of all trade, but master of none. On the other hand, GPUs or graphical processing unit represents a specialized knife, which can only do one thing, but do it really well. And the thing in this case being rendering graphics. Specialization in this case has a very big advantage as CPUs can only run things in a sequence, they take a lot of time in rendering graphics. But GPUs have no such restrictions and are able to run processes in parallel, which in turn makes rendering graphics with a GPU way faster compared to a CPU. Later on, this parallel processing ability will find many more applications, which would serve to reinvent NVIDIA and the entire industry overall. So with that, let's jump to NVIDIA's first phase of reinvention. It is 1996. NVIDIA is struggling for the last couple of years and has only nine months of runway left with no product in sight. And at this point, it takes about two years for any company to design and produce the next gen chip. But that was the time that NVIDIA did not have. As we say, necessity is the mother of invention. NVIDIA had to become the first company to start using software simulation to design and test their chips. While everyone else was doing it by physically testing, finding problems, getting it manufactured again, which took a lot of back and forth. But as NVIDIA was doing it via software, they were able to reduce the time to market down from two years to six months. In a super competitive market, speed becomes the only differentiator and Nvidia soon became the most powerful chip player on the market. Obviously, there, are, there were drawbacks, the quality and reliability of Nvidia chip was inferior to others. But as it turned out, the end user wanted power above anything else. Now, speed alone does not win you markets because slowly companies will catch up to you, which is why Nvidia created further defensibility by creating programmable shaders, which gave more styling option to game developers. And Nvidia also created their own software drivers, which meant better hardware software integration, which led to much better performance. Now, obviously, looking at this right now, you might feel all of these are obvious choices, but that is mainly because we know how it turned out. These bets took Nvidia to the brink of running out of money and a lot of short-term disadvantages. But all of it paid off and by the early 2000s, Nvidia was the biggest graphic card manufacturer in the world. And out of the 30 companies that existed, only three survived. While the first phase of change made Nvidia the biggest in the gaming industry, the second phase made them the leader in artificial intelligence, scientific research and compute. Mainly Jensen believed that gaming industry will not get mass adoption if the quality does not get better and does not get better fast. And the other much more organic trend came when Jensen started receiving emails about how Nvidia's GPUs were being used in academic research and were getting much faster results. Now, both these observations might look separate to us, but for Jensen, it represented one direction of focus, which led to the birth of their CUDA framework. So very briefly, remember, we discussed the ability of GPUs to run tasks parallelly. GPUs were able to do this because each task was not dependent on each other. 
and rendering graphics at its very basic represents matrix multiplication. So if you want to improve chip performance, you cannot really make them more powerful as they are constrained by physical laws. So the only way you could increase performance without breaking the theoretical limit was making chips work in a parallel manner. Think of it this way. If you have one chip, you can do a task in five minutes. Now, if I give you two chips that can work together at the same time, that task can be done in half of that time. That means two and a half minutes. Now you can theoretically keep on increasing performance without actually breaking any physical limit. The stacking up of GPUs might seem trivial, but was a major, major technical challenge. But as soon as it was unlocked, it led to a massive amount of improvement in the graphic quality of games and more importantly, made compute infinitely scalable. The success of this method can be seen in this graph. In 2022, NVIDIA revenue from data center is roughly $3 billion every quarter and it is increasing at a faster rate than the gaming revenue. But as always, the bet resulted in a lot of short-term pain. The cost of their GPUs increased without much to show which led to their market share in gaming industry shrinking. And on top of that, the market for academic use was very small to actually justify such a huge investment. Both these phases of NVIDIA demonstrate how Wang and NVIDIA are willing to take big bets on the way they believe future will shape up, even at the expense of suffering short-term pay. Understanding these two periods of change would also help us understand the next phase that NVIDIA has embarked on. NVIDIA is betting the house on three key things or trends. Their focus on making games realistic and open-ended, their increased push into creating their own data centers, and finally creating their own metaverse or operating system of the future. While all of these bets are unproven and would cost them tens of billions of dollars to execute, they also represent the way NVIDIA has always thought about the future and how it has always tried to disrupt itself. The three bets in gaming, AI, and metaverse might look disconnected, but again, each of them flow into each other. They're pushed to make games more realistic by ray tracing, which is basically instead of rendering objects in a predefined manner, doing so on the fly, based on the player's point of view. This not only would make games more realistic, but also have benefits of reducing the workload of game developers and would also allow games to become much more like real life. Metaverse or Nvidia's Omniverse also gets the benefit of ray tracing by making things realistic. And to add to all of that, Nvidia is also building a custom library of items which people can use in Metaverse, right from clothes, concert venues, to tools such as nuts and bolts, building utility both for consumer and enterprises at the same time. The final bet is a much more strategic push. While most of Nvidia's data center sales comes from their usage by the big tech companies, which in time will start creating their own GPUs instead of paying high margin for the ones they're getting from Nvidia. But for Nvidia, to stay relevant, they need to create an ecosystem where anyone who wants the power of compute can plug into their cloud and be able to get results as good as the big tech companies. Because sooner or later, when the big tech companies who also control the biggest cloud platforms create their own GPUs, they would move to their own chips for both internal and external users. Again, Nvidia creating their own cloud also helps in them uh, the, in their games and metaverse push in interoperability and also becoming device agnostic. Now, obviously, these are unproven bets, but I think, no, let's wait. Let's hear directly from Ben what he has to say about it. In other words, Nvidia has earned the right to be hated by taking the exact sort of risk in the past it has embarking on now. If all games in the future become full on simulation of all particles, Nvidia's investment in hardware will mean it dominates that era. Similarly, if AI applications become democratized, then NVIDIA will be positioned to pick up the entirety of the long tail. And if we get to a world of metaverses, then NVIDIA's head start on not just infrastructure, but also essential library of objects necessary to the make the world real will make it the most essential infrastructure in this space. I don't know if these bets will pay off, but all I know is that I love how Jensen approaches building companies. And we should all learn from the audacity and commitment to the vision that he displays. The biggest lesson for me out of the whole thing is to keep looking at how the future is going to shape up. Where are the trend lines? What are going to be the next biggest things? What are the, what are the biggest factors of growth in this industry? And thinking of the various ways your industry can be disrupted and then betting big on whatever conclusion you have come upon. That's it for this video. If you liked it, please consider liking the video and subscribing to this channel. I would see you next time with one more deep dive into the world of tech and business.